I don't know. What do you do, Avdi? You just hang out on the beach all day, and I've seen your <laughs> I've seen your ice pictures recently, which is why I said that. Yeah, yeah. I just hang out on Hoth and <laughs> catch some sun, and you know, hunt down the occasional wampa. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. This podcast is sponsored by New Relic. To track and optimize your application performance, go to rubyrogues.com slash new relic. This episode is sponsored by Code Climate. Code Climate automated code reviews ensure that your projects stay on track. Fix and find quality and security issues in your Ruby code sooner. Try it free at rubyrogues.com slash code climate. Does your application need to send emails? Did you know that 20% of all email doesn't even get delivered to the inbox? SendGrid can help you get your message delivered every time. Go to rubyrogues.com slash SendGrid, sign up for free, and tell them thanks. Hey everybody, and welcome to episode 143 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel we have Avdi Grimm. Hello. James Edward Gray. Hello everyone. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv, and this week we have two special guests. We have Hong Lee Lai. Yes, thank you. And Tinko Andringa. <laughs> Hi. And I tried very hard not to mess those names up. Sounds very good. Thank you for hosting us today. Yeah, so do you guys want to introduce yourselves really quickly? So uh, I'm Hong Li Lai. I'm, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Fusion. And at Fusion, we make Fusion Passenger, the application server for Ruby. Tinko is like um, our first employee. I've been at Fusion since the beginning, sort of, for quite a uh, short while after the beginning. And at the moment, I'm leading uh, the Union Station product, which is uh, a metrics or a web application metrics uh, app that you can use to uh, keep your Ruby on Rails applications in check. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, uh, and I have a lot of experience with the open source world even before I started Fusion. And we met together at the university, so we've actually known each other for a long time now. Oh, cool. Yeah. Now, you guys are based out in the Netherlands, right? That is correct. So, Passenger. Tell us about Passenger. Passenger is... Hmm, yeah, where should I be? I should start from the very beginning, explaining what Passenger is, like you are five. Sure, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. In uh, fact, I would prefer if all of our guests from now on assume that I am five because it's okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> I act like I'm five. Okay, so suppose you have a Ruby app. You want to put it on the internet so that other people can use it. How do you do that? Well, there has to be some way for the browser to talk to your Ruby app. But your Ruby app or Rails app cannot do that by itself. And if you come from a PHP world, then it would be very natural to put your app on Apache, and then Apache would take care of that connection between uh, your browser and the app. doesn't work like that with Ruby, because uh, Apache does not support Ruby by default, neither does Nginx. And that's where Passenger comes from. Uh, Passenger fills in that role and ensures that the web server, that is Apache or Nginx, can understand what your Ruby app is saying and that it can establish the connection between the browser and your Ruby app so that it can actually do something. That is Passenger in a, in, in a nutshell. And Passenger is unique compared to other Ruby app servers in that it's more of, a, more of an integrated whole. It is more of a holistic solution. It takes care of more things, has less moving parts, and it just tries its best to be damn simple and really easy to use and to be as least hassle as possible. Yeah, and um, because Passenger, like all other Ruby application servers, implements the REC standard, it can host any Ruby on Rails application without modification. Yeah, or any Sinatra or Padrino or whatever other REC framework you use. Does That's- it support any other... I, I guess I don't really know if there are other uh, web frameworks that run on REC, but does it support any other uh, systems? 
when it comes to Ruby, since five years ago, everybody supports REC. Before REC was invented, circa 19, sorry, 2009 or something, you had uh, Rails, you had Merb, and then you had a bunch of other frameworks that all had their own interfaces. And then came REC, and everybody supported REC after a year or so. So there is now nothing that does not support REC in Ruby space. Okay. Now, one other thing, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a non-Ruby tangent for a minute. When I install it, it asks me if I want to install it for Node and a couple of others. Yes. Python, Meteor. Yeah, I actually wasn't aware of this. Yes, that's because this is new. Since half a year ago, we started supporting um, Node.js and Meteor as well. And actually, Python support, it has been there since 2008. It was introduced as um, a proof of concept. Passenger was designed from the beginning to be able to handle not just Ruby, and then we added Python for fun, just to, just to show that it's possible. But we never really marketed that, and we really uh, we never really documented that. And it's just since recently that we started to uh, really push Passenger as a polyglot web server. That's interesting. So, yeah, how does that work internally? I mean, is it... Still basically the same engine with a little bit different interface on what it's talking to or what? Uh, I am i don't understand what you mean, sorry. Well, it's it's sort of, um, there's a, a loader that's written in Ruby for the Ruby uh, side of things, but the internals are all in C++. So okay. it's basically a, a small uh, Ruby or Python or Node.js app loads the app or, or part loads the app. And then it it sets up the protocol to talk to Passenger itself, which is in C++. Yeah, like the Passenger core, say 90% of the code, it's in C++. And that, that part is the same no matter what language you use. And the language-specific parts that establishes the connection between the language agnostic core and the actual language, that's just a very small part. Wow, that's cool. So when I'm talking to people about Passenger, I, I start hearing about things like workers and threads and all kinds of stuff. And uh, I, I haven't really taken the time to look at how Passenger runs my Rails app or, you know, Rack app in, internally. Can you talk a little bit about that, about workers and spawning and all that stuff? Yeah, sure. I think I should start with what a process is because I notice that a lot of times people get confused by the distinction between process and thread. So um, if you go to the basics, let's say you have a command line and you type ls or something, that starts a program. And that program, that instance of a program, is called a process. A process by definition and by how it is implemented on Unix, does not share memory with any other processes. And if one process crashes, then it does not affect any other process as well. So processes can crash independently from each other. And if you look at the context of Rails, then when people say worker, then what they actually mean is a Rails process or a Ruby process. And a process is just that, an instance of your Ruby program responsible for handling requests. And traditionally, Rails apps were only able to handle one concurrent request per process, Things have changed now. Uh, I will talk about that a little bit later. But um, it's still true for many kinds of deployment setups. One concurrent request per process. So what people do is they spawn multiple processes, multiple instances of the app, each one handling one uh, request concurrently. And then they put all of that behind a load balancer, say Nginx. And then Nginx sel selects a process which is free to handle things. And so that you can make use of multi-core and can have more concurrency and that sort of stuff. So when people say that Ruby has a global interpreter lock, it has got nothing to do with processes. And it does not mean that Ruby cannot use multi-core. It can. You just have to use multiple processes. And what I just said about spawning multiple processes, putting behind load balancer, that's actually what Passenger already does for you internally. So if you use something like Unicorn, then you have to do all this manually, and Passenger just takes care of, of all of this automatically without you having to do anything. And a thread runs inside a process. A process can have multiple threads, and threads can share memory with uh, with each other as long as they are running inside the same process. So if you have a thread from process A, then it cannot share memory with a thread from process B because 
processes don't share memory. And a thread is capable of providing extra concurrency. Nowadays, pretty much all Ruby frameworks have excellent support for multi-threading. So you can actually start an instance of your application that can handle more than one request at a time by having multiple threads. Um, and how those threads are used, it depends on the application server. For example, a passenger, the open source version, is a strictly multi-process application server, so it will start multiple processes, each one which are single-threaded. While something like Unicorn has the same design, it is also strictly multi-process, while Puma, for example, is multi-threaded. And in passenger enterprise, you also get the multi-threading capabilities. There are benefits as well as disadvantages to using threads. Uh, so if, if you're interested, I can talk more about that. But it, it all comes boils down to that um, multi-processing is easier to do, less things can go wrong, uh, but it also uses more resources. While uh, multi-threaded, it can potentially, not always, but potentially give you more performance, but it's also hard to do, can give you more bugs, etc. Yeah, we had quite a discussion about threads and processes with Jesse Stormer um, mm-hmm. a while back, so I'll just put a link to that in the show notes so that people can go and listen to that if they want. A more de- in-depth discussion of all of that stuff. Sure. You, had a, you had a really good description of it, though, and the um, the various trade-offs. So, uh, like you said, you know, it's more expensive to spawn up more processes, uh, resource-wise. So you may need more hardware quicker, whereas threads are generally cheaper and, and yeah. stuff. So you can get farther. How has like recent advancements in Ruby, say Ruby 2 and Ruby 2.1, where garbage collection and such got significantly better or the new copy on write friendly stuff, you know, it should make multi processes maybe a little less expensive, right? Out of all of those things, the only thing that makes multi-process less expensive is the copy and write garbage collector. Right. Uh, the, well, actually, uh, we did something like that back in 2008. Maybe some people still remember that. With Ruby, Ruby Enterprise and, Edition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Our findings back then was that on average you can save 33% uh, memory if you spawn your application in a specific way, and that is by using the smart spawning uh, method in Passenger or or the preload app setting in Unicorn. So uh, with Ruby 2.0 and 2.1, you can get the, those kinds of advantages too. But still, it's uh, it's still relatively heavyweight compared to threads. Threads are still a lot lighter. Sure. So let me explain that a little for people that don't know. The uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the passenger setting, but the preloading in Unicorn, and what was that passenger setting? Uh, smart spawning. It's on by default. Right. So... What that does, you said that processes don't share memory, but actually that's not entirely accurate. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Right. It's not entirely accurate. There is some sharing that goes on as kind of an operating system optimization thing. So when you spawn a process, by default, uh, a, a good efficient OS like Unix will just put a new uh, entry in the process table, but it won't bother to copy everything over. And what it will do instead is as you begin to change bits of memory in the program, then it will copy that memory over and change it in the new process. But in the meantime, it will just reference back to the original process. This is called copy on write. So when you change it, it copies it over. And we've talked about how Ruby's garbage collector has gotten better recently in storing, uh, you know, object uh, flags and stuff in a separate place so that it wouldn't invalidate everything that loads before. So what Hong Lee is talking about is these web servers have a feature where they will preload your app. They'll load up Rails and everything and uh, get the app running, and that that loading of all that, a lot of that doesn't change. Like, you probably don't change your model classes and stuff like that, just the instances of the models, right? And so by preloading all of that and then forking from there, you have all this shared memory that doesn't end up getting copied over as long as you don't modify that memory. Uh, so it makes it slightly cheaper in that they're 
those processes are referring to the same chunk of memory. So that's why advancements like Ruby's uh, copy on write friendly garbage collector was so important. Yes, exactly. Right. So Ruby Enterprise Edition, that was your attempt to do all of this before Ruby was really ready for that, right? You built your own custom version of Ruby to make this kind of thing friendlier. Yes, it actually uh, came out of a research project at the university. And also because back then we were extremely cash trapped and we didn't want to bother uh, paying $15 extra per month for the extra memory. So <laughs> then we thought, hey, let's optimize the Ruby interpreter. <laughs> That's, that is so the, the programmer way, right? Well, we don't yeah. want to spend $15 per server, so we're going to pay somebody's salary to go in and change Ruby. <laughs> well, we and were we... students back then, so the government paid our salary. Aha, oh, there nice. you go. Yeah, but, but it, it was still not much. Like, the $15 per month, it made a difference between whether you can eat well or not. <laughs> oh, there you go. Whether you get the high, high quality or low quality ramen noodles. <laughs> exactly. We talked about this uh, before the show, but I'm on the Ruby committers, and I actually remember the discussions when um, Ruby Enterprise Edition came out. There was a lot of discussion about whether or not those changes would be adopted into Ruby Core itself. And obviously, something like them eventually made it in, and you know, um, in later versions. But uh, they didn't take the changes uh, straight up, and it, it's a complicated issue, actually. A lot of people didn't understand why, you know, what, why they didn't just apply the changes directly to Ruby, but Ruby is meant to be a general purpose programming language, and um, the changes made in Ruby Enterprise Edition definitely made it more efficient, but for a certain kind of process, like a process that forks, for example, and then a slightly less efficient in the more general case. So, that's what the uh, debate back then was about and why it took Ruby so long to gain these features itself. So it was kind of an interesting thing. It, it led to changes, but much later, I would say. So yes. one thing that I'm a little curious about, we, we've talked about processes and kind of the advantages of going with processes, especially for MRI. But, you know, we keep hearing discussions about uh, threading in JRuby and Rubinius, which have different locking mechanisms that aren't as, uh, you, you know, they're not the global interpreter lock. So, you know, it, it is a little bit easier to do threading on those. Does Passenger take advantage of any of that? Or is it still spawning separate processes for each worker or whatever? Passenger, well, it depends on which version of Passenger. The open source version of Passenger only supports one thread per process, while the enterprise version supports uh, multiple threads per process, and you could have as many threads or as many processes as you want. You can totally configure that. So if you run, uh, run that on JRuby and Rubinius, then yes, you can take full advantage. Yeah, I was That's talking to a potential client, and he mentioned that I wasn't living right because I wasn't using Passenger Enterprise. And I looked at him, and I my Scooby <laughs> sense lit up, and I was like, Enterprise? <laughs> <laughs> so, That's interesting. So Enterprise takes the combination of both. You can configure processes and threads, so you can basically yes, have the best Yes, of it's hybrid. Ah, cool. Yeah. yeah, it's actually a fun story that we, back in 2008, we didn't take the enterprise uh, very seriously, so we, we called Ruby Enterprise Edition as a sort of ironical name for yeah, just something that's, that saves a little bit of mo memory. And but, now uh, you have an yeah, enterprise. Yeah, now we, have yeah, an now enterprise we actually product. have an enterprise offering. Yeah. Do you want that's to talk hilarious. about that for a minute? I mean, what, what are the advantages of the uh, Enterprise Edition? So we already had a multi-threading thing I discussed earlier. There is also more advanced resource control uh, mechanisms. Like oftentimes, there might be problems with the application due to bugs or maybe problems in the OS settings. Whoa, or... whoa, whoa. You're not talking about my applications. Whoa, no, whoa. no, no, no. Yours are totally perfect. <laughs> He's talking about mine, but I don't want to say anything. Uh, all right, just to be clear. Okay. Yeah, we're, so we're talking about ours. <laughs> <laughs> and Sorry, anyway, okay, sometimes it happens that, for example, you have a memory leak somewhere, or maybe you have an infinite loop somewhere because you made a typo. 
that sort of thing happens. And then passenger has these uh, safeguard mechanisms that can um, that can help keep your surfers stay alive in the event of those things. Like um, you can put a timer on your request so that if it takes too long time, then your request is is uh, aborted by killing the process, and of course also automatically restarted. Or you can put a memory limit on things so that uh, if something leaks, then it doesn't run out of hand. And then your process just gets resetted after that. Those kinds of things. And you can have more fine-grained control over the number of processes you want so that you can put uh, quotas on, on your server per app in case you have multiple apps on your server. There's also the rolling restarts. Yes, rolling restarts is it allows you to have better continuity for for your website. Like if you do multiple deployments a day or something, then by using rolling restarts, your app will not suffer any downtime or delays during a restart. Can I clarify really quickly? So when you say rolling restarts, are you talking about the process of basically waiting for the worker to finish the request that it's working on and then restarting and then pulling the next request that it needs to handle? Yeah, some, something like that. I think they're talking more about how Unicorn will spawn a new master process and then let the old ones die off, which I think is what you were referring to, Chuck, and yeah. then but yeah. new requests will come in on the new master, right? Yeah. When using rolling restarts, the processes will spawn in the background, and only when that is done, it will be automatically replaced with an existing process, and that is very quick, so that the user does not notice any of the restart time, which may take several seconds normally. Very nice. interesting. So I'm looking at the list here. What, what, what do you mean by mass deployment? So mass deployment is, let's say you have 15 or 50 websites all in a directory. And you want to deploy them all, or you want to put them all online. With mass deployment, you don't have to uh, write 50 virtual host entries in your web server configuration file. You just type passenger start, and then passenger will automatically set up a web server for you that can serve all those websites using the folder name as the virtual host name. So nice. is it bypassing Apache doing that then? It is using an Nginx core internally. Okay. Yeah, so it's using the Nginx API to uh, dynamically add the virtual host entries. Do you have to have Nginx in installed, or is that included in Passenger Enterprise? It is included. Okay. Yeah, some, some of these others, too, I'm a little curious about. So live IRB console? Yes, so sometimes uh, we have an issue with a process and we don't really know what's going on inside the process. We want to inspect its internal state. And then with Passenger Enterprise, you can attach an IB console to that process, and then you can run whatever Ruby code inside the context of that process to inspect the state that you want. Oh, wow. That's handy. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. nice. And also Ruby debug support, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. You said earlier that Pat, you think of Passenger as a more holistic solution than something like Unicorn. Can you talk about the differences? With Unicorn, you usually have to do, you have to take care of more things. There are more more moving parts. Like with Unicorn, you have to set up multiple Unicorn processes, and then you have to put those Unicorn processes behind an Nginx reverse proxy. So those are two steps. And then the third step is to set up process monitoring to ensure that a unicorn gets started when the system starts, gets restarted if it crashes, those kind of things. And all of that is taken care of for you by passenger. So in passenger, you just edit your virtual host entry inside your um, Nginx configuration file or Apache configuration file. You just say, I have this virtual host and uh, my app is here. Take care of all the other boring mundane stuff for me. And then it's done. That's interesting. So you're saying that passenger does its own internal process monitoring and load balancing and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so all, all those kind of stuff are internal. It takes care of that for you. Is there any way to make it do that for things like uh, background processes or, or demons that I've set up? Because Passenger handles so many details like load balancing and managing the processes and stuff, does that make it more of a black box, more of a 
thing I can't see inside of. Like with Unicorn, I can just list my processes and I can see there, oh, here's my master process, here's my worker processes. If one of them's hung, I can just kill it, you know, right there or whatever. Is How does Passenger make that kind of information available or does it? Passenger does make that kind of information available. It's just that you don't have to care about it if you don't want to. If you want to, you can. There is the passenger status command line tool as well as the passenger memory stats command line tool. And with those tools, you can see exactly what's going on and which processes you have. You can even manually kill things if you want. Passenger will restart stuff. Nice. So one thing that I'm looking at here on the enterprise page is that it says error resistant deploys now is that just the resource management or no error resistant deploy is a specific feature for the following scenario like sometimes you deploy a new version of your app but that version has a bug in it that you didn't really notice before and as a result your app will fail to start Mm-hmm. And normally, if you if you deploy a bad version like that, then it will result in total website downtime because the uh, because then no new version of your app can be started. It fails it it fails already during spawning. And if you have the resistance uh, option enabled, then passenger will detect that. And it will refuse to continue with the restart, and it will actually set a flag on the application. And then he will remember the fact that it failed to start and will refuse to spawn any further processes, and it will also refuse to shut down existing processes. In other words, it will try to um, keep the old version of your deploy running as long as possible so that, we- so that the website can be uh, available for as long as possible while you fix the problem. Interesting. That's really interesting. So those kinds of features are really designed to maximize uptime. Right. Yeah. So the the common theme of passenger enterprise is that we want to provide a service to people who are building apps and do not want to focus on any sysadmin stuff or as as little as possible. Yeah. Now that that is one other thing that I'm a little curious about, and that is that with systems like PHP, you mentioned at the beginning of the show, you know, the shared hosting and a lot of the other um, hosting options out there. I mean, there are just a ton of them. And with Rails, it it doesn't seem like there are quite as many because there's some level of setup. I mean, even with Passenger, you have to go and install it on the server because most of the time it doesn't come with it. Do you think that uh, Passenger or Passenger Enterprise may contribute to that becoming a little bit less of a, you know, a hosting story and, you know, it just becomes a common thing to have Passenger installed as well as uh, Mod PHP or whatever? Passenger is actually already installed on uh, many uh, hosting platforms. For example, DreamHost has been using it since almost day one. We explicitly designed for DreamHost. And there are many many other hosts out there. Um, I cannot remember them by name, but I, I I know there are many others. In cases where it's installed, you just have to um, activate that particular Apache or Nginx module, right? Yeah, yeah. You can uh, if Passenger is installed, you can just uh, add the line Passenger uh, enabled uh, on to your Nginx configuration file, and it will work. Cool. So it's, cool. uh, yeah, just a single line to activate it when it's installed. But yeah, the PHP has a, a huge advantage because it's integrated in Apache and Apache is installed on so many machines by default. Right. So that's, yeah, yeah it, it's always going to be one extra step. And, uh, yeah, we do try to make it as easy as possible, for example, by providing the Debian packages. Yeah. So that you can just apt get install. Uh, the passenger module, and then done. Everything else take care of you automatically. Eat your heart out, Red Hat. <laughs> <laughs> we are also working on RPMs, but it'll take a while. Yeah, he <laughs> needs them. I'm just kidding. Do you have any sense of if passenger is run more on Apache or Nginx? We support both of them equally. It started out with only Apache, and then later we added Nginx, and now we have excellent support for both. I think our customers are are preferring Nginx lately. Yeah, it it seems like more and more users and customers are switching to Nginx. Definitely gaining traction. Yeah, interesting. 
So I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the features that have come into Passenger over the last uh, several years. Uh, one feature that was really handy, and I, I think it came out kind of in a response to uh, RVM, was that you can specify which uh, Ruby interpreter you use per app, which was something yes. that I, I really missed when you first came out because it was kind of a global setting for your entire server. Was yeah. there a lot of work that you had to do to make that work, or was it more or less just uh, a few changes to the, the way that it spawns the app? Well, um, it was a lot of work, but not because we had to support multiple rubies. It's like um, we started supporting multiple rubies since Passenger 4, but Passenger 4 also included a lot of other internal changes. We started out with a lot of design decisions and assumptions, and then after a few years, it turns out that a lot of those assumptions no longer hold. So we had to change a lot, a lot of things, and the result was Passenger 4 has a much better internals and much more features, much more language agnostic, and that's also how multiple Ruby uh, versions are implemented. Yeah, basically we moved to an uh, evented architecture, and the whole, whole system became so modular that, that adding features like that became easier. What uh, features are you looking at adding now? For now, we are only focusing on stability. On the longer term, the daemon management stuff is definitely something that we want to take a look at, as well as introducing uh, RPMs. Yeah, and so, we're also busy trying to penetrate uh, the Node.js market and the Meteor market, so there's... Uh, we have actually had some uh, good response from uh, from the communities of Node.js, and we're working together with them to make it a, a cool experience for them. So, the, so, so these are our plans for now. We don't have anything super long-term yet. You keep mentioning that you're working on stability. Where are the stability issues with Passenger? Because I, I run it and I don't have any problems with it, but generally I'm not running things that are all that complicated or get that much traffic, so... The stability issues are just whatever issues people report on our bug tracker. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we have a lot of customers with completely different setups and different applications, and people will come with, with the weirdest platforms, and sometimes there's operating system bugs we have to work around. Sometimes there's just weird applications that do stuff a bit different, and it's, it's mostly getting passenger to work with every environment that our customers use. Yeah, Passenger is written in C++, and it's pretty low-level software, so a lot of things at that level can can go wrong. And although the the main use case is tr is tested pretty well, a lot of people uh, have strange I.O. patterns or strange traffic patterns then that can trigger edge cases where things don't work so well, and we just want to make sure all those th stuff works. It's really cool. I mean, I, I like the, the dedication you have to making it as robust as possible and just trying to, you know, make it so everybody has a, a solid experience on it. I think that really pays off, you know, when you're using the software. I know when I've installed it and gone through, it's just been, you know, so easy to get going with, you know, and, and uh, put up. And even when I do have something wrong, which is, you know, pretty much always my fault, uh, it pops up, you know, these great error pages and stuff telling me exactly what to do, you know. Oh, yeah, I love those error pages. I don't love good, seeing good them, but I, I love the information yeah. that's on them when I get them. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually something like, hey, dummy, you forgot to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Please go do this now. <laughs> Yeah, we did spend a lot of time writing those error pages. Like, uh, we regularly search Twitter and Stack Overflow for people complaining about Passenger. They don't always complain to us directly, but they complain anywhere else. And we actively search them, analyze the use cases where things go wrong, and we put code inside Passenger to take care of that and to warn them. That's just a lot easier than trying to answer the same question for the 600th time. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, well, one other thing that's interesting about that, I think, is that since Passenger is open source, we're pretty accustomed to our open source software being written by, you know, one or a handful of people who are out kind of doing it in their spare time, not necessarily backed by a company that's really dedicated to, uh, you know, keeping it up and supporting it and making it better. 
And so, you know, going to Stack Overflow is kind of a knee-jerk reaction, I think, in most of these cases anyway. But if people do want to report a bug or things, what's the best way for them to get that information to you? Yeah, so we have the the mailing list where we that we browse daily. Like uh, we're always on there, so you can get a response from from Hong Lee or from me rather quickly. And our paying customers, they they have a a dedicated email address that we respond uh, even more quickly when uh, when we get the time. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you you can find it if you go to the Fusion Passenger website and then you click Docs and Support. Everything is there. Good. Yeah, we're five guys now, I think, or six, maybe six. six. <laughs> so we're we're growing a lot uh, lately, and uh, yeah, it's it's it really uh, it's cool to be uh, supporting a product in this way because people are sometimes they are surprised that we respond so quickly. Like if you post a bug on our, our on our list, it will be within a day. There will be a serious developer making a fix or whatever. So uh, and, and we're experiencing that there's a, a demand for this. Like there's been this sort of feeling in the Ruby community uh, or at maybe the Hacker News community or whatever that uh, the the Ruby community is shrinking or that is becoming less less vocal. But we're actually experiencing that the the Ruby community is still as large as it was. But it's also becoming more serious, like there's bigger businesses in our customer base. We see that when we launched back in 2008, most users were like single server or few servers, except for the, the startups that hit it big. But there's a, a lot of, you know, small people that, that used uh, Ruby on Rails. And in the, the past few years, the customers just got bigger and now we're we're serving multiple enterprise customers, and like it's it's become a real, really serious business. The Ruby and Rails world. Yes, it's it's maturing a lot. Yeah, that's a good point. It's good to hear. No, I just want to say I think it's pretty cool. I mean, it's it's neat what you've built, and it's it's fun to use and play with. And thanks for doing that. It's awesome. No problem. Thanks no for problem. using. <laughs> yes, pleasure is all ours. All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, wrap this up and get to the picks. James, do you want to start us with the picks? Sure. I've got three. Let's see. First, I do this tactic all the time, and I, I like have never written about it or anything, and then I saw that Ernie Miller wrote it up on his uh, blog. So this is the uh, seven lines every rig file should have in it uh, for your gem. Uh, and it's it's basically just the how to launch an IRB console from your rake file. And I do that all the time and thought that was cool. So good blog post there. Another blog post I enjoyed recently, we talked a little bit about Sinatra on the show today. This was a post about how to structure Sinatra applications, which I think people often bring up as one of the complaints about Sinatra. You know, in Rails, you have the, the kind of provided structure and uh, how are you supposed to structure Sinatra? And this uh, article has several ideas in it, but really the main one is that you can build these little modules or apps and then just mount them under another app, and that gives you uh, your kind of hierarchical structure, much like Rails. So uh, it's a cool read if you spend any time building Sinatra applications. And then uh, finally I've been uh, playing some new iOS games, uh, Adam Keyes uh, told me about Lost Cities uh, on the iOS, and uh, he and I have been uh, playing a few rounds of that, and uh, that's great fun. If you've never played the card game, it's really good and simple, but it's kind of uh, maddening with the choices, and you end up watching the time and, and trying to squeeze out as many moves as you can in the time allowed, and it's pretty addictive. And this is one of those few games where I actually think it's a little bit better on the iOS because uh, in real life, you if you want to know how many turns you have left, you have to count the number of cards left in the deck, whereas on the iOS, it just tells you uh, the number all the time, and it, it keeps a running score, whereas in the real game, you typically count it at the end, so it's easier to see how you're doing as you play. So, yeah, Lost Cities on the iOS is pretty fun. Okay, those are my picks. All right, well, I've got some picks. The first one is a game called Relic Runners, and it, it's a lot of fun. Basically, you're, uh, you're building... It's kind of a mix between Lost Cities and Settlers of Catan <laughs> is the best way I can describe it. It's, it's a lot of fun, but basically you, uh, you run from... Or you have your uh, game piece move from spot to spot, and you're building uh, roads or trails, 
And anyway, what you're trying to do is uh, you move to the temples and they give you special abilities and then you um, eventually, when the temple is uh, completely excavated, then you have a, a relic that you're trying to get and so you have a way of moving that you can uh, use to get those. I just... Anyway, it's a lot of fun, so just take my word for it. It's it's a kind of complicated game to explain on a podcast like this, but uh, we really enjoyed it, and uh, so I'll put that up there. One other pick I have is, and I've picked them before on the show, but they just they made my day or my week last week. It's Hover.com. Now, Hover.com is my domain registrar. I finally got to move everything off of GoDaddy. Um, GoDaddy <laughs> just makes me crazy. That's uh, a great day. Anyway, what they have is they have a valet service that will move all your domains over for you. So I just went and changed my GoDaddy password and gave it to them. They went in. They moved all my domains over. You, as the listener, probably didn't even feel it move when uh, rubyrogues.com moved over. And that's because they they set up all the name servers. They copied all of the records over and just made it happen. And uh, I couldn't be happier. So I'm off of GoDaddy. Everything's on Hover. Their interface is way nicer to use. And I just, I can't say enough good things about them. So go check them out. Finally, I've been trying this Focus at Will. It's focusatwill.com. And uh, what it is, is they have a science page. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I I don't know if it's uh, junk or not. But it really does work for me in the sense that uh, when I'm listening to the music, um, and, and they talk about like the tempos and the type of music and stuff and how it it basically shuts off the voices in your head so that you can focus on what you're doing. And, and it really does kind of turn off all the back chatter in my head so that I don't get distracted as easily. And uh, then, you know, then I just have that clear thought process around what I'm working on. So um, you can go check that out at focusatwill.com. And those are my picks. Hongli, what are your picks? Um, my picks are twofold. One is Rails Composer. So Rails Composer is a template for Rails. You can pass it to Rails New, and then it will allow you to uh, pick a lot of components that are often used. For example, Device or OmniAuth, CanCan, Bootstrap, uh, RSpec, all, all those kinds of things. And it just makes it a lot easier than for you to edit your gem files for the for the 600th time. So this is great. And the other pick that I have is the UX crash course. And I think this is really important for um, pretty much everybody who ever works in the front end. User experience is so important. It's not just about design or about aesthetics. It's about making sure that people experience your app in the right way. For example, in the passenger installer, also a lot of user experience design has been put into it. So, um, and the kinds of principles that this website describes, they're, um, they're, they're not necessarily related to official user experience. So this seems to be a good guide. So I picked the, the third choice. And it's um, a keynote I watched. I, I did some research. I, I'm refactoring the Union Station app at the moment, and there was a lot of models that were used in, the, in multiple applications that should be in, in one jam. And I did some research, and I came across uh, an old uh, Uncle Bob Martin talk. It's the, the keynote at uh, Ruby Midwest 2011, so it's pretty old. But it's a very fun watch, and if you haven't seen it, you should... Uh, should look at it. He goes a bit abstract and a bit far, but the ideas are inspiring and it's nice and it's Uncle Bob Martin, so it's it's fun. Great. Well, thanks for coming, guys. We all really appreciate you coming and talking about Passenger with us. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, no problem. It was uh, it was fun. Yeah. Now, before we get too far gone, I also want to uh, remind everybody that we are reading Ruby Under a Microscope, and we will be talking to Pat Shaughnessy on February 27th. So that means that you'll get the episode like March 3rd or something. I was reading it literally before I came on this call. I read the chapter on caches. Awesome. (laughs) So yeah, so go check that out. And thanks for listening. We'll catch you on next week.